Hello and welcome back to another round of At Home with Sky F1, where we're taking a look back at some of our favourite features of the last eight years. This time, I take a tour of Motorsport Valley in my sister-in-law's camper van. Mercedes Technical Director James Allison gives us a beginner's guide to aerodynamics with my daughter's felt-tip pens. We learn a bit more about Alex Albon and the Thai driver who preceded him in Grand Prix racing. And I explain why you should absolutely, definitely, positively come to the Japanese Grand Prix. But first back to 2014, where ahead of the first European round of the season, the Spanish Grand Prix, I decided to take a tour of Motorsport Valley, encompassing all eight UK-based Formula One teams. But I decided to do it in my sister-in-law's 1975 VW camper van, and I decided to do it in the rain. The start of the European calendar in Formula One means two things. The return of brilliant summer weather and its upgrade season. So we're going to do something that's never been done before, never at least in a Mark II VW Bay Window camper van. And that's visit all eight British-based Formula One teams to have a look at the factory, speak to some key people and find out what they've got in development that could change their season. So first stop, Woking, and I'm really looking forward to going to McLaren. They've got the biggest, the best, the most fancy, the newest Formula One factory out of any of the eight that we'll go to today. And arguably, they've got the biggest job out of anybody to improve. Hello, Hello. Eric Boulier or, or Ron Dennis, are they available? He doesn't appear to have known we were coming. Right, well, not a great start, I must admit. We've been turned away. Apparently, they're all building the parts, too busy to come out and talk to us. So no surprise, really. McLaren haven't scored any points since March, the Malaysian Grand Prix. We'll leave them to it. Next stop, Williams. Maybe we were born to run. It's been overtaken by another camper van. What kind of thing have you got coming for Spain? For Spain, uh, we're concentrating on uh, cooling, so we've got a, a totally new cooling layout and then a few little aerodynamic tweaks as well. Bigger picture, Pat, do you feel that you've got the points, as you say, uh, that you deserve, maybe not that you'd like? Yeah, absolutely, and, and I have to say, I think that overall, you know, we, we've scored 36 points, nine per race on average, uh, and to me, we, we've, we've under-delivered a little bit. You know, what a force India bringing uh, perhaps you know when you're up the road a little way you might give me a call and tell me and then I'll know okay here we are the Lee Field Technical Center cater and probably the most remote factory of them all hello we're here to see Mark Smith it's a continuous uh, development program so anything that appears by the time we get to Europe will have been planned in actual fact possibly before the cars even ran for the first time. Our development gradient is actually significantly greater than it's, it's been at any stage of the team's history. Right, off to Lotus we go. You kind of said earlier on in the season that it wouldn't be until Barcelona, perhaps, that we see uh, the true measure of your package. I mean, you've seen in the last few races, we've made some pretty big improvements, um, but we've got another big package coming for Barcelona, and we think that's where we'll start breaking into scoring, you know, good points regularly. Thank you, Tesla. Well, if it's a Russian language on the door handle, you know we're at Marussia. What new bits are you bringing to Spain? We've actually got quite a few new bits for Spain. We've got a um, modification to the bodywork panels. We've got some changes to the front wing as well. The magnitude of the gain should be of the order that would put more clear water between ourselves and Caterham. To Mercedes and to uh, a team where the rain seemingly never falls on them at the moment. Presumably, you told everybody you will take, the, take the week off, upgrades, what upgrades? You don't need any upgrades. No, we're flat out as normal. Is it actually to defend your position that you're developing? Or? Absolutely. I mean, Formula One is extremely competitive. The wind tunnel is running constantly, and they found things only in the last few days which will allow us to change our plans slightly for what, what we bring to Spain. I tell you, if I was Red Bull or Ferrari and I'm hearing that, I would be depressed. You know, these guys are going to wrap the championship up around some Hungary time, mid-season. What have you got coming for Barcelona? We've got a lot of upgrades to the, uh, the Bahrain test, which we obviously raced uh, 
in China. We've got further iterations of those updates coming for both cars uh, that we'll be evaluating during Friday and then hopefully uh, racing those as well. I've just seen somebody carrying two rear wing end plates. Uh, ah, so you're not there. daft, are you? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's the end of the day. Ted's Tours Development Camper Van has made it to the World Champions. But for how long? And I can't think of a better place to park than right here in the spot for Mr. C. Horner. In truth, we're delighted where we are at the moment because, frankly, at the beginning of the year, we were in, in, in dire straits and I think we've actually done pretty well from where we were in pre-season testing, where we were pretty much written off. Paddy Lowe uh, said that they are not giving up at all. It doesn't surprise me at all. I'd be surprised if any team's packing up yet. Anything can be overcome. They can be caught. Oh, I think so, yeah. Well, that's it. It's taken us 12 hours, but we've finally done it. Eight Formula One teams in one day. I'm not sure I entirely believe Paddy Lowe when he says that they're still pushing absolutely flat out. Mercedes know they have a margin. They know that resource is only finite, and they'll be saving just to keep enough ahead. Will they win the championship? Realistically, yes. But looking at what Red Bull and what everybody else is doing, are Mercedes going to win all the races this year? I really doubt it. Whatever, it's a fascinating two races ahead. I tell you, that was a long day. It was 245 miles uh, in all between McLaren, Williams, Caterham, who don't exist anymore, Lotus, who are now back at being Renault, Marussia, who is now Haas, or at least Haas have the same factory that Marussia had, um, Mercedes, Force India, of course, Racing Point, and Red Bull Racing. There's a lot of teams in there and personnel in there, indeed. Mark Smith uh, and um, Nick Chester, who aren't at those teams uh, anymore. And um, Pat Simmons, of course, has left Williams too. Paddy Lowe, not at Mercedes uh, anymore, of course. Um, and to answer my own question, of course, in 2014, Mercedes didn't win all the races. There were three Grand Prix that were run by one by Daniel Ricciardo at Red Bull Racing, uh, not Sebastian Vettel. Danny Rick won three in Canada, Hungary and Belgium. But Mercedes did indeed win the rest of the Grand Prix uh, of that season, 2014, the first year with the hybrid turbo engines and Lewis Hamilton won the driver's uh, title that year, of course. But you know, um, of those factories, um, I, I thought at the time McLaren was kind of way up there with the most amazing factory, even though they couldn't see us that day. They were busy building the, uh, the upgrades they needed to improve their season. Um, McLaren were kind of up there with the best factory. Since then, in the preceding sort of six years, Mercedes have really joined them up with the, the most impressive F1 facility in the UK. Um, then you've got Williams and Red Bull Racing. Red Bull Racing is, is pretty good, it's pretty big, but it's spread over a few units in an industrial estate in Tilbrook, just outside Milton Keynes. Um, Williams is still a very, very much a top grade factory, a big factory. Uh, but then you do have the others. There's very much sort of uh, second division um, in terms of uh, Enstone, which is, which is getting bigger, to be fair. And then the facility that Marussia had uh, and then, of course, the Leafield Technical, which Haas now has. And then the Leafield Technical Centre that um, uh, Team Lotus and Caterham had, which now has sadly very much gone to, gone to ruin, uh, isn't used by anyone uh, anymore. But, um, yeah, it was uh, very interesting uh, to see. And thanks very much to my sister-in-law, Hannah Lamb, for the uh, loan of her 1975 Mark II VW camper van with the bay windows. Very nice in there. Right, next it's to Mercedes and James Allison, who explains a complex world of aerodynamics and computational fluid dynamics with the help of some felt tip pens. F1 2019, three races so far, three Mercedes 1 2 finishes. The best start to a season since the all conquering Williams FW 14B that carried Nigel Mansell to the 1992 World Championship. And in a Development Corner special, Mercedes Technical Director James Allison is going to help us explain and understand some of the best bits of the Mercedes W10. Now, James, I've borrowed my daughter's marker pens once again. The front wing has changed from last year. You chose to go with these full-width front wing flaps here, nice and chunky around here. So, traditionally, the Mercedes car has placed a really, really large amount of its performance on, on how the, the flow develops 
on that front wing end plate to front flap. Right, so you've been loading up this we part load up here. up the tip, yeah. Right. Now, when we first put these new regulations on, it hemorrhaged downforce off our car because one of our key features yeah. was totally broken. Right. So when I say hemorrhage, I mean about two and a half seconds gone. All of the interface between the front wing end plate and the flap was irredeemably knackered. We start working on it and we start to try to understand why won't the air go where we want it to anymore. And we start to modify the geometry, start to see how we can persuade it back into order. If you look in our launch car, you see that our front wing end plate doesn't even point outboard, it points inboard. Because at the time we froze that car, that was the best we could do. That was restoring some of the control that we'd previously had outboard restoring some of the load that we'd previously had outboard, mm. but we couldn't yet expand it sideways without it falling off the wing. Okay. But once we had learned how to do that, we by and large had managed to retain a lot of the power that we had in the tip of the front wing previously, which had been an important part of our world. Every wing tip, where you have a pressure difference between the, one, the top surface and the bottom surface, where that wing ends, you will get flow spilling around from the high pressure part of the wing on top mm. to the low pressure part and that spilling of the air across that surface from top to bottom creates a very very powerful vortex that runs backwards triggered by this tip of the flap here uh -huh. and runs downwards through the car and that vortex is making its way down here uh, and is being joined by dozens of others that are all triggered by these sharp edges and little winglets that all, at every one of their tips is creating another one of these things. If you have two vortexes that are going in opposite directions, they can sort of cancel one another out. But if you get them, if you get them to join up, they can amplify each other's strength so that by the time they hit the leading edges of the floor, when it hits that leading edge curvature, you get very, very low pressures, very yeah. high amounts of suction that pull the car down onto the road. If you want to look at the back of the car here, if you were going to cut a plane through the car at that point, we would want to make sure that ahead of these rear wheels, the amount of energy that is still left in the air that is attacking the back of the car, we want to make sure that the energy that's left there in the air is as high as possible. That high energy air is gonna work wonders for us with our diffuser, with our rear wing, uh, and with, uh, with a load of important sensitive structures, especially the cutout at the back of the floor, the gap between the wheel and the floor here, super important. You want high energy air arriving at that point. Okay. So if we can make this really slender and, and allow good air to come through it, some of which has been spun off this front wing, if we can create bodywork that is svelte and downwashing, then we're just encouraging, as, as far as possible, encouraging air, which has still got all the air energy of its free stream, to, to arrive at this part of the car back here, where it can do a lot of work for us with very little drag. I think that the opening three races of the year have probably made us look a little stronger than we, than we truly are. This is a fight. We're, we go into this race with absolutely no clue how it's gonna work out, and excited to find out. Okay, thank you. Well, my thanks to James Allison uh, for doing that and to Mercedes as well. You know, James Allison really is, I think, one of the best, if not the best, in, in explaining uh, complicated aerodynamic concepts and anything technical, really, in Formula One uh, to a lay audience and um, audience of idiots like me as well. But these were the, uh, these were the pens that, uh, that we did it with. Um, and they're just these sort of chalk pens, these uh, felt-tip pens. And I had the idea after watching my daughter's uh, draw with these and, and they give a sort of matte finish but a very thick line and I thought if we got some matte photographs then you'd be able to to, to trace lines on them without the sort of glare um, and sort of trace where the uh, where the airflow was going. It was also interesting in there about how Mercedes turned around what they found with the new regulations with the new front wings at the beginning of last year how much that had shedded downforce from the car but how they managed to get that back to claw that back to really dominate the first half of the season in the way they did and ultimately uh, win the title. I, I loved um, when James Allison, uh, when I pointed out some little things on there, he said, uh, woo, as in uh, not very particularly uh, impressive, but um, 
we thought it was anyway but uh, yeah uh, that was all that was all good stuff and uh, that's um, wouldn't that, that that's the short version if you want to um, listen to James Allison uh, for a lot longer and, and let's face it who wouldn't want to do that you can if you go on to Sky Sports if you go onto our, our website skysports.com slash f1 and then in the search box search for uh, development corner Kravitz and Allison you'll find the full 17 minute version there uh, the full version uh, complete with cameraman in the middle trying to hide between that behind that black cloak of course it was important because we needed that camera to get the top shot of the photos uh, underneath us whereas the other camera was getting um, uh, the wide shot which is why you saw that cameraman in the middle with that black cloak uh, trying to hide the tripod and everything right to our third feature uh, on at home with sky f1 and uh, this is last year we did this with the rookie alex alban it's easy to forget that last year was alex alban's first year in formula one he was driving for toro rosso at the time and i wanted to get a little bit uh, more information on him and how much he knew about his countryman his predecessor the first thai driver in grand prix racing b Bira who raced in the 30s, 40s and 50s. And where better to start than Clapham Common? One of the revelations of the season has been the performance of the Anglo-Thai rookie Alexander Albon. So we've come to a Thai restaurant in Clapham, where else? To find out a little bit more about Thailand's second Grand Prix driver and the Prince of Siam who preceded him 80 years ago. Can I have a Thai green curry, please? Thai green curry? Or hang on, no, what am I having? The jungle curry. You want to go for it? They yeah, go, I'll try, yeah, the, I'll try yeah, the jungle curry, but just a little, uh, a small, small one. We're going to see Ted sweat live on the TV. I'll have to go traditional. Could I have a beef penang, please? With a sticky rice. Thanks. So Alex, tell us about your background. My mum's Thai. My dad's British. Uh, born in London, not too far from here. Quite a normal childhood. Uh, my dad liked racing, so I guess he was the guy to introduce me to go karting and, and uh, things like that. What were you like as a kid? <laughs> quiet, really, really quiet. Uh, doing my own thing. Again, kind of, I would just uh, have my Hot Wheels and uh, make imaginary races in my in my head, and that was pretty much me. Let's put in the middle. You're gonna show. Yeah, the anywhere, any, every, anywhere. Yeah, great. Thank you. I'm not going to let you have all of these prawns. They look too good. They are good, actually. Apart from the great food, why did you decide to represent Thailand rather than Britain? I was born in London, but I, I spend a lot of time in Thailand. I am a Buddhist. I, I, I'm very close to my mum, and, and, and my mum's side to that extent. I feel, I feel Thai, so um, it wasn't a difficult decision in that sense. But um, I know people like to call me the London-born Thai. <laughs> Just came back from Monaco. That was great, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. P8 for you, best finish in, in F1 so far. P7 for, for Danny. To be honest, the race was a good race. Danny and I got, let's say, mugged off a little bit by Carlos at the start. But then after that, um, good strategy and, and the car was quick. I think really, if we could have cleared Carlos, we were definitely the best of the rest. You certainly were. And your four points in Monaco gives you now your career total so far is seven points, which is one point less than first Thai driver, Prince of Siam, B. Bira, Prince yes. Bira. How much do you know about him? I'm aware kind of his upbringing. Um, I would say he's quite similar to me in a, in a way that he's, he's Thai, but he, he's been brought up in the UK, or he spent a lot of his time in the UK. OK, well, I tell you what. Yeah. Let's finish up here. I'll get the bill. Okay. And uh, I want to show you a couple of places in southwest London which are key to the Prince Bira story. It sounds good to me. Princess Margaret asks Bira what his chances are against the all powerful Italian team. So, this book was written by Prince Bira's first yes. drive, Cyril. So, there he is. Athletic. Yeah, he looks strong. There he is with Fangio. He was an Olympic sailor. Uh, a I sculptor. Remember he went to like, the Olympics three times, was it? Yeah, 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 yeah. He represented yeah. Thailand. But you know, it was two days before Christmas in 1985 that an old man in a trench coat had a heart attack and and mm. passed away on on these platforms. And that was Prince Bira. Nobody knew who he was. He didn't have any identification on him. And except there was a message in his yes, pocket. Yes, I heard about this. Yes, in Thai. In Thai. Yeah. And they found it was addressed to Prince Bira. 
Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Amazing. Right, let's get on the district line and head off down to Wimbledon. I go into the weekend karma. So here we are, Wimbledon, the Wat Buddha Padipa. Yeah, And good. the temple, which is the final resting place of, of Prince Bira. No, really cool place, yeah. I think it's quite surreal, this place. I mean, you come into this place with a house, and in the back garden you have this amazing temple. Mm, yeah. What about the future then? Is the ambition still Formula One world champion like everybody else? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, first it was to get into F1 and then afterwards, yes, world champion is, is, is the next thing. But um, at the minute, just focusing on, on my job now, it's really just taking step by step. Um, we'll see in the future, but um, yeah. Well, you've certainly got the somewhat of the Prince Bira racing spirit <laughs> somewhere in you. Thank you, yes. And uh, it was a, a, a pleasure to get to know you and, and no. get to know some of his life as well. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Great, no, thanks very much. I really enjoyed making that feature, and it's not often you get to go on the tube with a Formula One driver, but uh, uh, it was very peaceful, actually, in the, in the Buddhist temple there, the Wat Buddha Padipa. Uh, in southwest London, where Alex goes before every Grand Prix with his trainer Paddy, uh, just to just to pray and to meditate and to get a blessing, uh, and um, he finds it sort of centres himself before a Grand Prix, and hopefully for his sake brings him luck. I thought that was uh, really interesting stuff. Um, there is a mistake in there. I have to correct. Uh, the Wat Buddha Padipa is not the final resting place of Prince Bira, and that amazing story of uh, the Prince of Siam. Um, I was told this by uh, uh, Narisa Chakrabongse, who was actually the uh, daughter of Prince Bira's manager, Prince Chula. And it was Narisa who brought Prince Bira's ashes back from the UK to Thailand. And uh, Thailand is actually the final resting place for Prince Bira's ashes. So um, I was happy that, uh, that Narisa actually got in contact to uh, tell me how that particular story uh, ended. But uh, I thought that was really interesting. Also, there was the story about whether Albon was eventually going to replace Pierre Gasly. We didn't ask him specifically in that feature, you know, do you feel you're ready to replace Pierre Gasly if the call comes from Red Bull Racing to move you from Toro Rosso to Red Bull Racing? It was kind of inherent in what he was saying. He was only going to answer it one way, which is that he's concentrating on what he's doing at Red Bull, at uh, Toro Rosso at the moment to do the best job he could. And then he was going to see what happened. And in fact, it did happen. He indeed did from the Belgian Grand Prix onwards replace Pierre Gasly and has kept the seat for this season or next one uh, uh, as it will happen. But uh, yeah, great lad. Uh, the Thai born, the London born Thai driver, as we call him, Alex Albon. Right. Um, final. Uh, clip here final feature for my at home with Sky F1 and it's from last year it's a travel guide I don't do these very often I tend to leave them to Rachel uh, or Natalie who are much better than me at doing them but I've got a little penchant for Japan and as at the time it seemed like the center of the sporting world or it was going to be the center of the sporting world I thought I'd look at why you should definitely positively absolutely come to Japan for some sporting inspiration <laughs> Japan is currently the center of the sporting universe. The Rugby World Cup has brought hundreds of thousands of Western fans to Tokyo, just as many have braved the weather to be at today's Japanese Grand Prix. And in nine months' time, Japan is hosting the big one, the Olympic and Paralympic Summer Games. So there's never been a better time for you to get on a plane and come and be part of the action. All right, first the downsides. It is a long flight from Europe and it is fairly expensive to get here, but you can find good deals out there online. The eight hour time difference and jet lag will have you falling asleep at tea time and waking up at 3.30 in the morning, but you'll get over that in a few days. <laughs> 
The upside of getting around is that Japan boasts the most efficient public transport system in the world. You can plan whatever trip you're doing with the utmost confidence that it will get you there on time. It really is marvelous. You'll find Western-style hotels in the tourist hubs of Tokyo, Osaka, and Kyoto. But outside the cities, chances are you'll be staying in a Japanese business hotel. Ah, hello, Kravitz. The rooms in these hotels are tiny and all the same, so it's best to appreciate their eccentricities. There's the compact bathroom where you can have a shower and brush your teeth while sitting on the loo. what this button does. Whoa! A modest space for storing clothes. And don't be alarmed if there's rice in your pillow. It's a Japanese tradition. Just turn it over, it's a normal pillow the other side. Now, when you go into any restaurant in Japan, all the staff will shout at you as soon as you come in. Hello. Don't worry, they're not telling you to get out. It's irashemose. It means hello and welcome. Don't say it back to them. Just smile and nod. Even if you don't like sushi, don't eat raw fish. What's wrong with you? Oh. Ah. Mm. A fatty tuna. Toro, fatty tuna. It's pretty much impossible to eat badly in Japan. Chicken teriyaki, prawn tempura, wagyu beef, ramen noodles, and tofu. And if you still don't like Japanese food, there's an Italian restaurant and a curry house in every town. The beer, biru, and sake, sake, isn't bad either. Kampai! Kampai! And if all that soy sauce is making you thirsty, Japan's got your back. There's a fully functioning vending machine selling hot coffee and cold drinks on every street corner. And they never ever steal your money. Get to the Suzuka Circuit train station, and then it's an orderly walk to the circuit. And once you're there, there's the amusement park and the roller coasters, or you can amuse yourself, joining in with some of the most eccentric and passionate fans in Formula One. <laughs> So to sum up, everything is brilliantly organized. Everyone is polite and respectful. The transport is efficient and reliable. The food and the hotels are great fun. And that is why you should absolutely, positively, definitely visit the Japanese Grand Prix. Arigato gozaimasu. Yay, Japanese, bye bye, bye bye. Well, sadly, how much has changed in the space of a few months as we all grapple with this uh, terrible virus that's postponed the Japan, the Tokyo 2020 Games to 2021. Uh, we can only hope we'll be there for the Japanese Grand Prix in uh, October. But uh, yeah, very much not now the sporting centre of the sporting world for 2020. So we hope that all goes uh, well next year. Just a couple of things from that. It was a pleasure to make. Great shots of the vending machines uh, in Tokyo. I thought they were very arty. Um, if you're wondering about the, uh, the jet lag, it is that bad. Um, I didn't set an alarm. That wasn't uh, faked up, uh, set up. Um, I just woke up at three in the morning, turned the GoPro on, turned it on myself, and then did in fact hit my head on the... Uh, on the uh, the bed head um, but uh, it was all right after after the end of it um, managed to get back uh, to sleep eventually but the jet lag is something you will have to do if you do indeed follow my advice and come to the Japanese Grand Prix because they're brilliantly uh, organized the people are great as you can tell I love my sushi uh, I love Japan as well so it really was a pleasure uh, doing that and um, much recommended highly recommended for their passion for Formula One Right, that's it for this edition of At Home with Sky F1. Thanks very much for watching. Look after yourselves and each other, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.